And now we take you to Evangel Assembly of God in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Today we're talking about the power of personal choices, and we're going to talk about choosing victory. If you turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, I know some of you are turning on your phones and your devices, but I, I like to hear the rustle of pages, okay? Let me, let me just hear those pages rustling as you're, as you're turning there to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I ran across this story recently. It says, yesterday, I went to the doctor for my yearly physical. My blood pressure was high. My cholesterol was high. I'd gained some weight, and I didn't feel so good. My doctor said eating right doesn't have to be complicated, and it would solve my physical problems. He said, just think in terms of colors. Fill your plate with bright colors, greens, yellows, reds, etc. I went right home and ate an entire bowl of M&Ms, and sure enough... <laughs> Sure enough, I felt better immediately. I never knew eating right could be so easy. Well, life is filled with choices, and what we eat is one of those choices. But I'll tell you, by our choices, we walk in victory or we forfeit victory. And today I want us to look at how King David chose to walk in victory long before he ever became king. We're going to start reading in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 2. It says, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. His height was six cubits and a span. That roughly translates to being about nine foot, nine inches tall, almost 10 foot tall. Now, We've got some tall men in our congregation. One of the tallest is Brother Norm Munyon. Norm, would you mind just standing up here? Norm is six foot, seven inches tall. So everybody would agree he's a pretty big, big, pretty big tall guy, right? Did you know the, the tallest two guys to ever play in the NBA were, were just about a foot taller than Norm? They were seven foot, seven inches tall. Thank you, Brother Norm. I believe we've got the a graphic. The first is Manute Bowl. He's from Sudan. And the second one is a fellow from Romania named Georgie Murasan. They were both seven foot, seven inches tall. But that means that they were still over two foot shorter than this guy named Goliath. Now, back in the year 1888, there was a painter named Osmar Schindler. And Osmar said this is maybe the way it looked when young David got on the battlefield with that big, tall Goliath. And then in 1915, another painting was done. And... Uh, uh, he doesn't look quite as big in this painting, but you can see his armor bearers standing there with him, and he's making fun of David. He's laughing at David in that picture. Well, let's go back to verse 5. It says in, in verse 5, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, that is a coat of armor, and the weight of the coat of armor was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That coat of armor weighed 126 pounds. You know, I mean, we've got some strong people here today, but I wouldn't want to walk around with 126 pounds of armor on me all the time. Verse 6, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. It weighed 16 pounds. Can you imagine? Just the, the head of the spear weighed 16 pounds. And a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel. And he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. And if I prevail against him and kill him, 
then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all his Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. When Saul and all the armies of Israel heard this giant, they were afraid and greatly, af- they were, they were, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Then, then New International Version says they were terrified. In other words, they began conceiving a vision of defeat and a vision of failure. And the first point I want to share with you this morning is this. Many people fail because in their mind's eye, in their heart of hearts, they see themselves as failing. They carry a vision of failure in their heart. They carry a vision of failure in their mind, their will, and their emotions. Proverbs 4 tells us to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. And if you don't guard your heart, I'm telling you what, saints, There are emotions that you have, and there are demonic spirits who will try to fill your mind with thoughts of failure, with thoughts of of not making it, with thoughts of not measuring up, with thoughts of not being all that you can be. So we have to guard our hearts and our minds. When I was a kid in elementary school and later in high school, I used to, I was not a very good student. I didn't learn to study until I got in college. Thank God for his mercy that I got through high school. But I used to have my days, I wondered, am I going to make it through high school? And and one of the things I was terrified of doing was standing in front of a class and giving a report. Anytime we were told we had to give oral reports, my knees would begin shaking. And I would always go to the teacher and ask, can I get out of this? Is there something I could do? You know, and I just did not enjoy doing that at all, at all because I'll tell you what I carried in my soul, in my mind, will, in my in emotions in my mind's eye I saw myself standing in front of people and stuttering and stammering and I saw myself breaking out in a cold sweat and I saw my knees starting to knock and I was terrified of the thought of speaking publicly and 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 you know I carried that with me even into college and when I was a sophomore in college I enrolled in a speech class not because I wanted to It was the only class that would work out with my class schedule. And I remember I was in that speech class, and the professor said, everybody in this class is going to give a 10-minute speech. Now, I'd already sensed that God had called me to be a pastor. He'd called me into ministry. And I remember I would argue with God for, for days, say, God... I can't speak. You don't want me. And then the Lord reminded me that Moses felt the same way. He says, Lord, call somebody else. I don't speak so good. Jeremiah felt the same way. He said, Lord, I'm just a youth. Call somebody else. And I went to see this professor and I said, I said, is there, can I do something for extra credit? Can I do something and not give this speech? And, and it was Dr. Beatrice Coley, and she was a, a wonderful Christian woman up at Emmanuel College. And she looked at me, and she smiled sweetly, and she said, Terrell, there are two things that you need to understand. Number one, I want you to trust God to help you. And number two, I don't want you to talk about something you don't know about. I want you to give a 10-minute speech about something that you are familiar with. That's something that you are, you already know about, something you are comfortable with. And I started praying right then, well, Lord, what am I comfortable with? What, what in the world can I talk about? And you know, when I was in high school, I worked at the mall at Stein's Men's Clothing. It later became Richmond Brothers. But I had a manager named Bill Sinclair. And Bill invested in all of his salesmen because he may he said, I'm going to teach you not to be a clerk. I'm going to teach you to really be a salesman. And I want to teach you how to help people when they come in the store. They're, they don't all together know what they want. They just know they need an article of clothing. I'm going to teach you how to, how to help them figure out exactly what they need. And you'll come away with some sales. 
sales. And here's what he taught me. He said, when a man comes in and he's interested in a suit or a sport coat, he says, if you can figure out what size slacks he wears, what his waist size is, he says, then that will tell you what size coat to put on him. Because usually what you do is you take the waist size and you add six, and that gives you the coat size for most people. Not for all people. Some people will lift a lot of waist. Athletes come in and they have a lot. You add 10 to their waist size to get their shoulder size. And some guys, they're just built differently, you know. But he says, usually you can add the number of six. He says, so here's what you do. If a man comes in and he starts looking at suits, you say, sir, I'm so glad you're here today. May I assist you? And you engage him in conversation. And then you, 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 if he knows his waist size, you listen. But usually, usually if they're 36, they're going to tell you they're 34. So he said, he says, you know, I'm talking about men now, okay? I'm not talking about women. And he says, if you can get that tape measure around his waist and get that measurement, and then you'll say, sir, I see that you, you're you a size 34. He says, go over to the size 40. Add six to that number. Go over to the 40s. And he says, grab a suit off the off the rack. Doesn't matter what color it is. Say, sir, I realize you may not be interested in this particular suit, but let's try this coat on just for size. And, and, he, and, he, and he says, fuss over him a little bit. And he says, get him to button it and get him looking in the mirror. And if his wife's there, oh, just get her to brag on him some. And, and then just have the pants in your hand and start rolling up the, the leg and say, sir, wouldn't you like to just to try on these pants just for sizing? You may not like it, but just for sizing. And he says, 70% of the time when you get him in those pants and he's got on that coat, he says, have your chalk ready to mark up those pants size. He says, because that guy's going to buy it. And he says, and while he's changing clothes, you get a shirt that'll go with it and a couple of ties and you get it spread out. And when he walks out of the, the dressing room, he says, you get it just right for him. And you give him several options. And especially if his wife's there, you give him at least three options on the ties. So you know what I gave my speech on? How to sell a suit. And it felt comfortable. And I got an A in the class. And I began to think, hey, I can do this thing. Now, folks, here's the problem in life. Sometimes we get sick. And we will pray. But instead of praying in faith, we just kind of go through the motions. We get sick and we allow ourselves to start meditating on that sickness and that pain. And we'll, 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 we'll see ourselves getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And so I've even had people tell me, say, Pastor, I got sick and I, and I saw people gathered around my bed because they knew the end was near. Pastor, I even saw people coming to my funeral. I saw people looking down on my casket. Well, folks, there's only one problem with that. Jesus said, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have them. In fact, let's look at at Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Read this aloud with me. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. When does our believing take place? After we received No, our believing has to take place when we pray. In other words, when I am praying, I've got to get a vision of God answering my prayer. I've got to have a mental image. I've got to have a vision in my heart. When I'm praying for something, I'm not praying in doubt and unbelief and despair. I'm praying in faith, believing, and I'm saying, Lord... You said, what's everything I desire? When I pray to believe that I receive them. So right now, I just believe that I'm receiving this answer to my prayer, and I thank you for it, and I give you glory, and I give you praise. And somebody says, well, Pastor, I did that one time, and I didn't get the answer to my prayer. Well, I want you to look at me and hear me with both ears. Your faith is not invalidated because your prayer was not answered the way you wanted it to be. Tell these folks too. Your faith is not invalidated because your prayer is not answered the way you wanted it to be. We still serve a God that hears and he answers prayer. But we've got to pray in faith believing. He doesn't say that we believe after we prayed. He doesn't say that we believe after we've received the answer. It's important to keep believing throughout. You know, 
Sometimes we pray, but we're looking at the wrong thing. Sometimes we're praying and we're looking at our sickness. We're looking at our symptoms. We're looking at our pain. We're looking at our, at, at our need. We're looking at our, at our, at our, at our problems. We're looking at, 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 at the, the goose eggs in the checkbook. We're looking at, at this thing that's not working and that thing that's not working. Folks, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's so important that when we pray that we don't conceive failure in our heart, but that we can see victory in Jesus name. You know, the Bible says pray without ceasing. I remember as a young Christian, I read that verse and I says, okay, I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray. But you know, a lot of my praying was really complaining. I'm sure there's nobody in this house today that's ever done this, but I have to confess that a lot of my praying was complaining. It was whining. It was feeling sorry for myself. It was telling God, God, if I was you, I wouldn't let you go through this. I take good care of you, Lord. Why are you letting me do this? And one day it dawned on my lightning fast mind that when I pray, I got to exercise faith. That when I pray, I better get a vision of victory in my heart. That when I pray, I better better see that answer coming. When I pray, I better start giving God glory and giving God thanks. See, if I'm going to be above my circumstances and not under them, then I got to pray in faith believing. Somebody say hallelujah. Again, let's read Mark 11, 24 together aloud and loudly. Everyone, here we go. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I love the story that Dr. Paul Young Yi Cho tells. He says he had just gotten out of Bible school. Korea, he was living in Seoul, Korea, and Korea was struggling in those post-Korean War years. What in America, we call it the Korean conflict. But Korea was struggling economically. He said he was so poor that he lived in a surplus U.S. Army tent, even in the dead of winter. He said that the, the, the snows, I've never been to Korea, but I'm told that in the dead of winter, the snows hit Seoul quite heavily. And he says he was living in that U.S. Army tent, just about to freeze to death. And he says he would begin praying. And he said he, the desire of his heart was for three things. He's, he's just planted a little congregation. He doesn't have many people. But he's got a desire for three things. Number one, he wants a bicycle. Number two, he wants a desk. And number three, he wants a chair. That's what he's praying for. A bicycle, a desk, and a chair. And he said he started praying about it. And he decided he wanted to pray specifically, so he went and got him some pictures. He got a picture of a bicycle. He got a picture of the desk he wanted and of the chair he wanted. And he began to describe them to God. And then he read in Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them. And Cho said he started, he started seeing himself in his mind's eye. He said he was still poor as a church's mouse. He was still living in a surplus army tent. But he began, began seeing himself riding that new bicycle. He began seeing himself seated in that chair at that new desk. And he just began thanking God. And then he says, you know what? He says, women get pregnant with babies. I got pregnant with a bicycle, a desk in a chair. He says, I was big on the inside with a bicycle, a desk, and a chair. And he says, the day came that I was riding my new bicycle, and I wasn't just having to say it by faith, and I wasn't having to envision it. God helped me to get a new bicycle, and I got the very desk I wanted, and I got the very chair I wanted. Can you say hallelujah? Um, Let me share with you six things about faith. Number one, faith is not something we have as much as it's something that we do. Faith is active. Number two, faith is always now. It's present tense. Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is. Hope is future tense. Faith is present tense. Number three, faith is believing before seeing. Number four, faith is not passive. Faith in God is active. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. Number five, faith is always accompanied by hope and love. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, now abides faith, 
hope, and love. Dear ones, if you're exercising faith in God, but you're not loving other people, if you're exercising faith in God, but you're not doing well with hope in your heart, something's amiss and you need to make some course corrections there. Number six, faith in God comes from hearing and meditating on the word of God because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You'll never have any more faith than you've got the word of God inside you. Now let's look again at verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. And in and, and, and just a second, we're going to jump down to verse 17. Let me just kind of fill in what happens here. Jesse has seven sons. The first three go to war. They're part of Saul's army. So Jesse sends his seventh baby boy, his seventh born baby boy, to go check out what's going on, bring him a report, and to take some supplies to them. And so we begin reading at verse 17. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. He took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him and he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle for Israel. Israel and the Philistines had drawn in, up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. He ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the men, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Man, wouldn't you love to be exempt from taxes? Somebody say, hallelujah. No more federal, no more state, no more local, no more county. Come on. What a great deal. Verse 26, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, David's relationship with God was more real to him than that giant Goliath standing out there on the battlefield. Dear ones, hear me. When you stand in faith and believe God, you might, you might at times have to turn away from critics. Look at, look at what happens after David speaks his faith. Verse 28. Then Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he says, why did you come down here? And with whom have you, have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. There was the second point this morning is when you stand in faith and you believe God, you may have to turn away from critics who are going to criticize you. You may have to turn a deaf ear to, to doubt and unbelief. Let me tell you something. Dogs bark and cats meow and critics criticize. And there are people who will criticize you and me sometimes. And it's really not so much because we are standing in faith. But here's what happens. Our faith is an indictment against them. The very fact that you're serving Jesus Christ is an indictment against the life that they're living. The very fact that you're standing in faith and believing God can be an indictment against them. And so they can get critical. Look, look, look with me at verse 31. Now, 
when these words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he said for him, he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and I struck it. And I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he's defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. He's going to deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Dear ones, sometimes you just need to meditate on the bears that you killed and the lions that you killed and the victories of the past. Sometimes there will be giants on the horizon. But dear ones, I'm telling you, God has given you victories. Don't you forget about those victories. Don't you forget about the time that God's met your needs. Don't you forget about the times that you were sick and God healed you. Don't you forget about the time that you were out of food and God supernaturally provided for you. Don't you forget about the time that you were discouraged and you didn't think you could keep going and God sent somebody, an angel of the Lord, somebody encouraged you and strengthened you. Don't you forget about the times that you didn't think you could keep going, but you made your way to the house of the Lord and you felt the sweet presence of his Holy Spirit and God began to minister to you and God began to, to help you and God began to comfort you and to do what only he can do. Oh, I'm telling you, David was far more conscious of the victories that God had had, had won for him than he was about the size of that old Goliath. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 37, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Verse 38, so Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he also clothed him with a coat of mail, with that coat of armor. And David fastened his sword to his armor and he tried to walk for he had not tested him. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Here's our third point this morning. You will never know victory as long as you try to walk in somebody else's anointing. First John chapter, first John chapter two, verse 20 says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know the truth. See, every believer in Christ, the moment you, you, you come to Christ, you receive an anointing. But that doesn't mean that anointing is developed. And it doesn't mean that that anointing is cultivated. And it doesn't mean that that anointing has been nurtured. And it doesn't mean that you've gained a sensitivity to the Holy Ghost. Because I'm going to tell you, you've got to cultivate and you've got to nurture your anointing. When I was a young pastor... In fact, I hadn't even started pastoring. I was still in Bible college, but I'd preached two or three sermons. And one night I was going to preach in a, in a little church on a Sunday night in, in, in North Georgia. And uh, so I got my sermon together. It was, I was preaching from, Rome, from Acts chapter 8, verse 6 about Stephen. It says how Stephen was full of faith and power. And he did great so- signs and wonders among the people. And they could not resist the wisdom by which he spoke. And I had planned my message, and I knew that I should have spent more time praying and preparing my own heart. But I knew my daddy did a lot of praying. You know, dad's 80, 80, almost 87 years of age, and and, and God's anointed him. He he spent his life praying and communing with the Lord and, 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 and preaching and bringing deliverance and healing and salvation to people. In fact, he's 80, almost 87, but he's preaching this morning up near Valdosta. And, and, and anyway, I knew dad spent a lot of time in prayer and I'm thinking, well, why do I pray? I just call him. 
So I called dad and we prayed together. But I I remember preaching that night and that message went over like a lead balloon. I mean, it just, it didn't have, I mean, it was like sucking all the oxygen out of the room. I mean, it was just, it was not anointed. And man, I left there and I was convicted in my heart because I had not prepared my own heart. Let me tell you something. You have an anointing in your life and you're the only one that can cultivate that anointing. You are the only one that can nurture the anointing in your life. And the way you cultivate and the way you nurture that anointing is by spending time with God. It's by, it's by denying the flesh and just saying, I'm going to pray here. I'm going to spend this time with God. And you pray in your understanding and you pray in the spirit and you pray the word of God and you meditate and read the word of God. And you just spend time. You hang out with God. You spend time in his presence. I know some people say, well, I spend a lot of time waiting on the Lord. Well, I understand what they mean, waiting in the Lord, but, but we're not, I'm not really waiting on the Lord. What I do is I'm just in his presence and I'm just, I'm just hanging out with him saying, would you come and fill me anew and, and afresh today? Oh Lord God, I need to be saturated and marinated in your presence. I've got to develop that anointing. And David says, I can't walk in these, th- 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 this armor. I've never even tried it out. You can't walk in somebody else's armor. You can't walk in your grandmama's armor. You can't walk in your granddaddy's armor. People can pray for you. I can pray for you, but I can't do your praying for you. I can read the Bible. I can preach the Bible to you, but I can't read the Bible for you. I can't meditate on the word for you. I can't wait in the presence of the Lord for you. I can't hear the voice of the Holy Ghost for you. You're the only one that can do that. Amen. Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had and a sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained. In other words, he disrespected David for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. Ruddy means he had, 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 had perhaps had red hair. He had a red complexion about him. So the Philistine said to David, am Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. I'm going to tell you, there are times that your circumstances will seem to curse you. There are times that there are demons that will seem to curse you. It will seem that life is cursing you. But I'm telling you, dear ones, you don't have to just listen to what life has to say. But you can arise and say, you know, the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. But Christ has come that I can have life and I can have them more abundantly and I choose this day to walk in victory. I choose to be on top of my circumstances and not underneath my circumstances. The choice is yours. Now here's the demons in this man Philistine, uh, in, in this man Goliath, the Philistine. The demon spirits are cursing David. Verse 44, the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied and this day not next week not next month not next year but this day the Lord's going to deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth the all the earth may know that there is a God in in Israel, then all this assembly, now folks, we're called the assemblies of God. All this assembly, the Hebrew word that's here translated assembly means a multitude of people who have been called out and called together. There's a Greek word in the New Testament, ecclesia or ecclesia, ecclesia. 
And it means of people who've been called out of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's dear son. It's for talking about the church. Now look what he says. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword. The Lord does not save with a spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Dear ones, in an atmosphere, it's the last point this morning, in an atmosphere that was pregnant with doubt and unbelief, David dared to speak his faith in God, and he prophesied a vision of victory. And some of you need to start prophesying a vision of victory over your life. You need to start prophesying a vision of triumph in your life. You need to start prophesying a vision of healing in your life. You need to start prophesying a vision of supply in your life. You need to start prophesying a a, a vision of hope and a future. And you know what? Members of the body of Christ can support you. We can pray for you. We can strengthen you. We can try to help you. But at some point in time, you're going to have to arise and in the night watches. You know, David, I was reading, reading this week, Zach, in the Psalms, several places, David says, my heart instructs me in the night watches. You know what that means? That means he was, couldn't sleep. He was an insomniac at times. He couldn't sleep. And there are times that when you can't sleep, there are times when things don't seem to go on right. You've got to rise and you've got to start prophesying. You come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day, Vern, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not sometime out there, but this day, this day. This day, God's going to give you into my hand. And all this assembly, all these fighting men over here who have been pregnant with doubt and unbelief, all this Israeli army who's been, who's, who, you know, they would look at that Goliath, that giant for 40 days. He, he, would just, he was a terrorist. Some of us thought that Arnold Schwarzenegger was the original Terminator. He was the Terminator, man. And he was putting fear. And people had a vision of fear. Oh, dear ones, it's easy today to get a vision of fear. Oh, look what's going on in America. We got a governor that still wants to cut jobs in Tallahassee. God bless Governor Chris. I, I, I mean, Dr. Governor Chris, Governor Scott. Can't even think of the right governor's name. You will edit that in the TV program, won't you, Jim? <laughs> he has to edit a lot, I'll tell you. Amen. <laughs> I love our governor, but it breaks my heart to see church members struggling because of jobs that are not continuing. But I'm going to tell you something our God's bigger. you got to know that your God's bigger than anybody that's cutting a job. you got to know that your God is bigger than everything that goes bump in the night. Your God's bigger than your aches and your pains. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And if God be for us, what? Do we say, I can't even quote it right. Help me, Bruce. What do we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Glory to God. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel is all about making the name of Jesus famous and his church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 10.30 and Wednesday evenings at 7.00. 
We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.